This is Dr. Sam Haynes. This is where he teaches history, UT Arlington. This is his new book. We're going to talk a little about the book today. And we're going to talk a lot about race today. In Unsettled Land, Dr. Haynes focuses heavily on race in Texas in the run-up to the revolution, naturally. To publish in the history genre today, a heavy focus on race is simply non-negotiable. Dr. Haynes wants you to know, as every deconstructionist historian for the last several decades has wanted you to know, that the so-called traditional, triumphalist, Anglo-centric, white alpha male (laughs) narrative a lot of descriptors, but they all mean the same thing. Well, that is bad. It's not inclusive. It ignores people of color entirely. But never fear, Dr. Haynes brings news of another new narrative. Now, if you, if you know me, you know I don't like the camera. I don't like to be in this chair. So I wouldn't turn the camera on to do a book review. Y'all can read the book, draw your own conclusions if that's a thing you'd like to do. And if you do, Leave a little review of Unsettled Land down in the comments, and we'd be happy to read those. Today I turned the camera on because I have some quibbles with what Dr. Haynes says when he's out giving talks to promote his book. The first is by no means unique to Dr. Haynes, but he illustrates it so well that we're going to use him to talk about it. You've seen this a thousand and one times on social media, and you've heard Texas historians say it. Whatever it is, um, whether it's slavery, Mexican-Americans whatever. This isn't in our textbooks, and why don't kids learn about this in school? Roll Dr. Haynes. The book that I used in the 80s uh, hasn't cha- has changed hardly at all. Um, we're still telling students exactly the same story over and over and over again. If you remember your Texas history, and how could you forget, uh, when we get to the Mexican Republic, it's Stephen F. Austin and the old 300 all the time. I still have that book that, that we used, and I have looked at and done a careful study of some of the uh, books that are used today, and they have barely changed. I looked at one of the recent and the most popular Texas history textbooks um, about a month or two ago, and it hasn't changed one darn bit. Stephen F. Austin still sucks up all the oxygen out of the room. I mean, it's chapter after chapter on Stephen F. Austin. Those people, those white alpha males, they really do dominate the stage. Uh, But chapter after chapter about Stephen F. Austin. And how many seventh graders have been taught about just Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin? Um, Millions. And I'm I'm not being hyperbolic. Literally millions. And we're not going to talk about Native Americans here? I mean, it just seems just like professional malpractice. Austin, Austin, Austin. Chapter after chapter. Professional malpractice. Dr. Haynes says he's carefully studied a recent Texas history textbook. Well, so have I. I've also studied the one that he likely used when he taught seventh grade at the Kincaid School in the 1980s. So here's what is really in the textbook about Stephen F. Austin in 1980 and also today. In the textbook adopted in 1980, Austin first makes an appearance about 100 or so pages in, in Unit 2, after sections on geography, individual Indian cultures, and Spanish explorers. Since it is a compulsory topic of contemporary conversation in a classic we-don't-teach-this-in-school trope, yes, actually, the 1980 textbook did list slavery among the causes of the Texas Revolution. As for professional malpractice and not talking about Native Americans, well, the modern Texas history textbook published, I think, in 2016, offers a full chapter on various individual Indian cultures. And there are additional mentions, obviously, throughout the story as they impact the story of Texas. Just Stephen of Austin, Stephen of Austin, Stephen of Austin. By contrast, there are two sections in one chapter about the Austins and the Austin colonies, totaling nine pages. And these are heavily illustrated pages. Nine pages. Just Stephen of Austin, Stephen of Austin, Stephen of Austin. There are necessarily other mentions of Austin in subsequent chapters as the revolution draws nearer in the context of his role as a military leader and as a prisoner in Mexico City. 
Look, the textbook covers the prehistoric era through the present century. Austin died in 1836. So how, how is it possible Dr. Haynes can imagine there could be chapter after chapter about Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin? And why would he expect his audiences to believe that? My best guess is that he knows you're not going to spend $90 on a textbook and look it up yourself. Just Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin, Stephen F. Austin. So that is the reality of the textbook situation. Dr. Haynes is either pulling the wool over our eyes or he's just not a close reader. Let's move on. And so he is a, you know, an important figure, uh, but not a major player in the events that lead to the Texas Revolution. He's an ally of Stephen F. Austin and so on. Um, but he's not a major player. Dr. Haynes is speaking here about Lorenzo de Savala. Keep this statement in your back pocket. We're going to need it in a minute. Lorenzo de Savala was not a key player in the Texas Revolution. How have we missed this? The answer is pretty simple, I'm afraid. It's because we've made Anglo-American historians have made this story all about us. For about a century or more, uh, all historians were white men. And they told a story that privileged white men. And that can't be much of a surprise. We don't talk about this guy. And why don't we talk about him? The Texas revolutionary story was written by Anglo-Americans and they made the story all about us. And how could American historians possibly miss the important role that Zavala plays? And the answer is pretty simple. I mean, we've made the story all about us. Haynes claims that we ignore Lorenzo de Zavala's importance in the run-up to the revolution. Then he wonders aloud how his profession could have ignored this obvious cause of the war. And then he answers his own question, because white men have been writing the history and they made it all about white men. I think Margaret Sweat Henson, if she were still alive, would beg to differ with Dr. Haynes. Her biography of Zavala explored his political intrigues in the run-up to the revolution at length, nearly 30 years ago. I kind of wonder why prominent Hispanic historians who have been publishing and researching and teaching for decades never took up that research thread. I also wonder why Professor Haynes doesn't wonder the same. So anyway, does Dr. Haynes have proof that historians have neglected Zavala? Let's roll it. Zavala is important, and we have totally ignored him. And if you are in any doubt about how we have ignored him, then I'm going to give you Exhibit A. Exhibit A. Exhibit A. And if you don't believe me, then I'm going to draw your attention to Exhibit A. I don't have Exhibit B, so this had better work. Exhibit A, Your Honor. Ooh, a mystery. What could it be? Back in the 70s, John Jenkins compiled all of the letters he could find about the Texas Revolution. Uh, it's a mammoth collection. It's 12 volumes. No, it's, it's 10 volumes. John H. Jenkins, 12 volumes. It's 10. In 1974, John Jenkins published this magisterial 12 volume set. 1973 and it's 10 volumes. John Jenkins published this magisterial collection of papers of the Texas Revolution. It's 10 volumes. There you go, now you've got it, 10 volumes, but Jenkins didn't publish it. The military historian, General J. Matthews, published it. It was the inaugural offering of his Presidial Press. And um, if you're a Texas historian, and you're writing about this period, you have to use Jenkins. There's no other choice. It's not complete. He didn't have access to Mexican archives, but he did his best. And in the 70s, he published this extraordinary collection, which is now online. You're welcome. I did that. You go to the last page of volume 12, and you want to know about Zavala. If you look up Zavala, this is what you find. And go to the last page. I dare you, because this is what you will find. Y'all know I cannot resist a dare. We may go there in a minute, or maybe we don't have to. I mean, you can go to that last page for free. Go to texashistorytrust.org, click on Read Our Books, and go to Papers of the Texas Revolution. Bam, volume 10, last page, and you're there. But we're going to let Dr. Haynes show us. 
this is what you see. Zavala Lorenzo Day, and Zavala's name is misspelled, so that should be a tip-off right there. First of all, his name is misspelled, and he never spelled it with two L's, so that should tell you something. Zavala, Lorenzo Day, last page. And already there's a problem because Zavala is never spelt with two L's. No, Lorenzo didn't spell it that way, but several of his correspondents most certainly did. You know what's also spelled wrong in the index? The New Orleans Grays, Gross's Retreat, the surnames Ferguson, Collinsworth, Dimmitt, and Kinchelow, among other mostly Anglo names. Zavala, I think, is the only non-Anglo name that is misspelled in the index to PTR. Let's not deprive Dr. Haynes of his big reveal and his laugh line. Let's roll that, shall we? But that's what you see. Uh, too numerous to, to list. Too numerous to list. <laughs> what, what the hell? Uh, too numerous to list? Uh, what is going on here? That's what it says. Too numerous to list. And if you've ever done research, then you are gobsmacked. Uh, I know that I was. That's it. That's his big gotcha moment, his Exhibit A. Zavala's entries were not enumerated in the index of papers of the Texas Revolution. That's it. There's a lot of correspondence about Zavala, but he can't be bothered to tell you where it is. Well, there are a lot of letters, but we just can't be bothered to tell you where they are. In other words, they, they do not tell you where you can find his letters in the preceding 11 volumes. And those four words tell us so much about the way American historians have tried to understand these events. I mean, that really speaks volumes. Uh, it, it, it tells us two things. It tells us about Zavala's importance because there's so many of them. And it tells us about the stunning lack of interest that we've shown in trying to find out who this guy is. So Dr. Haynes has told us that every Texas historian must know and use this set. They can't avoid it. It's canon. So why didn't he tell us that the index is notorious among Texas historians for being god-awful and mostly useless? I digitized PTR with an emphasis on search capabilities because the index is so notoriously bad. You cannot convince me that Sam Haynes was unaware of that fact. As for the stunning lack of interest in Zavala, that may be true, but not because the indexer was white. He was indeed a white man, but he wasn't John Jenkins. Jenkins did not work on PTR by himself. It was the brain baby of a military historian done in collaboration with a military historian. As that historian, General Matthews, gathered the papers, he called the project Military Papers of the Texas Revolution. Matthews compiled the index, not Jenkins. And how do we know? The introduction to volume one tells us so. Basic Texas books tells us too. The entry in Basic Texas books tells us outright that the index sucks. This hasn't exactly been a secret. Lorenzo de Zavala was not a major player, as Haynes himself tells us, in the run-up to the revolution. Nor was he really a player at all in the military maneuverings of the war. Once we understand the context, who did the indexing, and that his focus was on the military aspects of the war, we better understand why Zavala may not have been a priority. And I'm not saying that's acceptable. An index is vital, especially as a roadmap to nine volumes of text. But I will not concede that the omission was because of race. You know who else's correspondence wasn't indexed? David G. Burnett, and likely for the same reason. Santa Ana, also not indexed, and likely that was because references to him were too numerous to list. There were 803, to be exact. San Antonio? Too numerous to list. But New Orleans has hundreds of entries. If Dr. Haynes or any of y'all are curious, there are a total of 135 entries for Zavala with 1L and a dozen or more for Zavala with 2Ls. So the gotcha moment? Not really all that he cracked it up to be, huh? The index just sucks, and Dr. Haynes should have known that decades before he started work on this book. The index does not enumerate Zavala's correspondence, but Zavala shares that distinction with several of his 
Anglo colleagues, and Santa Ana himself. Historians in recent decades have written so many books that claim to unseat the heroic Anglo traditional myth narrative, whatever. Again, a lot of words, but they all mean the same thing. I certainly don't begrudge Sam Haynes for taking a crack at this genre. He is, after all, a product of his profession. What I do have a problem with is that he and others like him seem to think that we, the public, are a bunch of rubes running around in coonskin caps who need to be scolded and told, your narrative is bad. Here, listen to mine instead because it's more enlightened. We don't need to hear that. We're adults. If you want to add a lengthy treatment of Indian migration to a book about early Texas, you go right on ahead and do that. Do it well, make it captivating, and we will read it. Show us the people who left their mark on Texas. Richard Fields was a fascinating character. Let us appreciate him as we will, rather than standing on a stage, wagging your finger at us, and saying, oh, your heroes are calcified and worn out. Take this one instead, and shame on you for ignoring him. Oh, a random thought on Dr. Haynes's book. He spends a fair amount of time on Richard Fields, the Cherokee chief, and shades him in a solidly positive light. Fields owned slaves. And I don't mean in the Native American versus Native American, we're going to take some of y'all captive kind of slavery. I mean the go to a slave auction and purchase human beings, chattel slavery kind of slavery. Richard Fields owned slaves. So I wonder if that shouldn't relegate him to pariah status if we apply the standards of academia to everyone of every ethnicity. If you want to tell stories of free black men like William Goyant, who achieved much, like regardless of his race or in spite of his race, he was a man of achievement. Do that. That's exactly what our current seventh grade textbook does, but without diminishing anyone else in the process. They just tell the story of a man who did great things. Claiming that a particular history has been hidden or erased or is invisible does not make it as compelling as the events that transpired at the Alamo or San Jacinto. That magic trick only works in the academy. The fact is, most of the white alpha males that Haynes describes so resentfully had achieved some level of fame before they ever arrived in Texas. And what happens when nationally famous people die in a dramatic way? See also Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the Big Bopper. They loom larger, they stay famous, and no new narrative that you can write can undo that phenomenon. You all know that, but you still all try to write the book that's going to make those men unfamous. Unless one of you succeeds, I fear you're going to continue to tell the public how little we talk about people that we actually do know and talk about. At the end of the day, we, the members of the very diverse public in Texas, will choose whose stories resonate with us, with or without your damn race lectures, and that's just what we're going to do. It's what we've always done. You don't need to apply a destructive brush to one group to elevate the groups you've written about. You don't need to tear down dead historians to elevate yourself professionally. And you damn sure don't need to lie about textbooks and tell half-truths about 50-year-old reference books to promote your own. As a rule, the public don't like that, and it's not because we're unintellectual, toothless troglodytes. It's because we know that if you have to disparage another story to sell yours, your story probably ain't that good, or it's driven by resentment. We don't like resentment. We like gratitude. What you all call chauvinism or unwarranted pride, we call gratitude for our history everyone in it and the complexity of it all, and for the place that we live. You like to say that Texans have a distrust for expertise, and I don't think that's so. I think we inherently distrust people who constantly tell us that we're idiots for finding value in stories that you prefer not to write about. Don't tell us what's bad about everything else, past and present. Tell us what's good about your book, about your work. Tell a better story, and for God's sake, tell the truth. Remember, y'all, if something doesn't sound right, there's a chance, a pretty damn good chance, that it's not. It's always worth following up. Texas History Trust is always here, always watching, and always following up. Thanks to our donors for supporting us in these efforts.
Until next time, God in Texas, y'all.